Good morning, I'm Pastor John Reamer. It's so great to have you with us as we continue our series in the Book of Romans. I'm the pastor of Grace Point Church. You can find us on the web here at gracepoint.org where we have the Roman series and other Bible teachings which are free for you. Paul, the Apostle Paul, he was a persecutor of the church and radically changed as he encountered the resurrected Christ. He'd been out planting churches for 25 years, but he'd never been to the church in Rome. So he wrote this letter, and we've already gone through the introduction and the thesis statement of it in the last three weeks. Uh, but he wrote this letter after 25 years of church planting, hoping uh, to visit them. And because he hasn't visited them, it's a longer explanation uh, of the gospel uh, because he wants to lay all that out and apply it to the church. This morning, our sermon will be on chapter 1, 18 through 32. And it asks this question and answers it, what is wrong with humanity? One of my favorite books that I studied in high school in British Masterpieces was called The Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. He actually was Polish and didn't learn English uh, till he was a teenager working on a ship. Uh, the Heart of Darkness is a brilliant story written in 1899. The main character is Charles Marlowe. He's recounting the story of his adventure to some friends as they're anchored on a boat in the River Thames. And the adventure is that he went up the River Congo into Africa to find a man named Kurtz. Kurtz was a journalist who then worked for the ivory trade and the rumor was that Kurt had gone mad and that he had had all the savages, uh, those in the heart of darkness of Africa, worshipped him as a god. And so this novella, one of the greatest ever written, is the story of him traveling up into this heart of darkness. Uh, it is considered to be the most studied and written upon literary work in English classes in universities. I myself wrote a paper on the symbolism of color uh, within the novella itself. The point of the book is that man in his heart is dark, and outwardly it looks like the Africans are given over to evil, but he shows very powerfully that the British in their imperialism and colonialism are, are no different. Uh, their hearts are just as dark. The only difference is the veneer of civilization. Conrad uh, wrote in 1899, as I said, at the beginning of the Age of Optimism, where people believe that scientific progress and education, industrial development, uh, the Age of Progress, would solve the problems of man. The expectation was so high going into the 20th century, but the 20th century showed otherwise. The number of wars in the 20th century killed 108 million people. Communism, which was supposed to be for the people, uh, was the most oppressive system of all time. And in the 20th century alone, 100 million people were killed by communist regimes within their own country. Now, it's unarguably true that we are more productive. Uh, technology has benefited us. Uh, we have a better way of life, but like the heart of darkness, the veneer of technology has not changed the heart of man. As we are more and more prosperous, drug use continues to go up. Uh, the more affluent, the higher the addiction rate and amount of drug use. The internet is wonderful, but it has poured pornography into homes and destroyed uh, people's lives and marriages. Progress won't solve the heart of darkness that lies within man. You see, progress as a solution is the wrong diagnosis and the wrong solution. See, to get the right solution, you need to have the right diagnosis. All you have to do is read the newspaper today, uh, look at news stories for a week, even for a day, and you see that there is something terribly wrong with humanity. It has nothing to do with sex, age, race, or economic strata. Uh, the violence, uh, the hatred, uh, the self-destruction, 
the suicide rate is highest among those who are the wealthiest. Money won't make you happy. You need the right diagnosis to have the right solution because any solution doesn't work unless it matches correctly the diagnosis. Let me be very personal here. Uh, I have a condition called rheumatoid arthritis, which really isn't arthritis. It's from the original definitions years ago when they didn't understand it well. It's an autoimmune disease, very common among women, rare among men, and it usually follows a predictable pattern of diagnosis. In my case, being a man and later in life, when it struck me, uh, my factors for diagnosis were very odd. Uh, what happened to me is one day I got out of bed to take a walk and when I stepped out of bed and my foot landed on the floor, it felt like my right foot literally broke. I thought a bone had fractured or maybe I'd had a piece of glass uh, on the floor, but of course it was my bedroom. That was ridiculous. So I went in uh, to see doctors, went to an orthopedic. Uh, they x-rayed it and said, you know, we can't see a fracture, but clearly this is a stress fracture. Now, I never heard of a broken bone that didn't show up on an x-ray, but what do I know? So I followed the doctor's advice and put on a Dutch shoe, and that was supposed to keep the foot stable and in six weeks be healed. But after six weeks, the pain got worse. In fact, it was so bad that I could hardly walk. Uh, I took the Dutch shoe off, could only walk in a slipper, went back, saw another doctor. Another doctor said, well, it has to be a fracture. And I said, why doesn't it show up on the x-ray? He goes, I don't know. I left discouraged. A few weeks after that, I woke up one morning still with a great deal of pain in my right foot and my left elbow was frozen, literally frozen. I could not move my arm. I was in extreme pain and couldn't move. So now my right foot hurt, uh, it had become swollen and my left elbow wouldn't work. It was around Christmas time. I got through Christmas with the kids and then went into the emergency ward. I got a young doctor there who sort of looked like Doogie Howser. I thought, oh, I got a kid out of medical school. And he said, Mr. Raymer, I'm not going to let you go till I figure out what's wrong. They can only keep you in the emergency ward for 23 hours and 30, 30 minutes, just short of 24 before they have to admit you. He ran every test he could think. I was poked, prodded, x-rayed, scanned. Uh, they looked for things in my brain. Uh, a psychiatrist came in wondering if it was psychosomatic. And he ran a bunch of blood tests and he came in after I'd been there almost 24 hours, I was thoroughly exhausted, in pain and discouraged. And he said, Mr. Raymer, I have ruled out everything I can think of except one thing, a disease called rheumatoid arthritis. And I had barely heard of it. I'd seen little old ladies with crippled fingers and I was scared, frankly. I went home and researched it and I was terrified. The statistics for men are not good. Untreated rheumatoid arthritis takes 15 years off the life of a man. And I read that many men who have rheumatoid arthritis commit suicide because it is an incurable progressive disease, uh, often with very severe pain, destroying joints in the body, attacking internal organs. Uh, many men die of heart attacks because it hardens the pericardial sac and you literally squeezes your heart to death. I was crying out to God and, and praying, and of course, all the well-meaning people came out of the woodwork, uh, try this juice, try this natural that, uh, do this, do that. Everyone had their little one-off cure, usually some way to make money on it. And I went to a rheumatologist, and the first one wasn't very good. And I was in such bad shape, I had to take off a leave of absence from work. I was in such pain, I couldn't even walk. Then I got to another rheumatologist, better diagnosis, better treatment, and it took several years, and I take some very strong medicines uh, that help me. Uh, some well-meaning friends were like, don't take the medicines, it has side effects. Well, the main effects are far worse for not having it. And I just thank God that uh, that was about 10 years ago, and three years ago, I was able to run five half marathons, and two years ago, I was able to trek 112 miles in the Alps by myself, carrying my pack. Now, I still suffer from some of the effects of it, and I take strong medicines. But see, it took the right diagnosis to get the right treatment so that I could move on and enjoy my life. 
And if you don't have the right solution about diagnosis, about what is wrong with humanity, you're never going to have the right answer. And the Apostle Paul, this is a tough passage, I'll warn you, from 18 through 32, but a necessary one. Uh, like when you go to the doctor, uh, let's take my case out of the way. Uh, let's say you're worried you have cancer, and in fact you have incurable cancer, or seemingly incurable cancer. You don't want to go to the doctor and have her say, well, you know what, let me just give you a big hug and take some vitamin C and go home. You'd be furious with that. Some of us want God to be like that, to just give us a big hug and wish us well and let us go on our merry way. But see, God cares about us enough to tell us the truth. And so he tells us the truth about what humanity is really like. It's a tough story, like hearing a tough diagnosis. The day I heard I had rheumatoid arthritis, it broke my heart, frankly, because there was no guarantee the medicines would work. But if I didn't have that truthful diagnosis, I couldn't be where I am today. And so this section of Romans, we're starting today and for the next several weeks, it's pretty tough, but it's a necessary diagnosis to take us to the healing grace of God. So the diagnosis that Paul uh, tells us here is that we have chosen to suppress the truth to God, our creator's existence because of our preference for unrighteousness. We suppress the truth of God because of our preference for unrighteousness. And then that turns into uh, different behaviors. And because we do that, God is justifiably angry. That's kind of a summary of the passage that we're going to look at this morning. If you look back at verse 17 from last week, it says God has revealed a righteousness of God. God's character, God's saving action, and how he makes us righteous. And now we're going to see, verse 18, that the wrath of God is revealed. So righteousness revealed, wrath revealed. God is doing both. So let's read, starting in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what is plain, what is known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his internal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. I want to make uh, three observations here. One is Paul says the wrath of God is being revealed because of our choices. Now, when we think of wrath, we think of human wrath, uh, like a guy in a bar who gets angry and lashes out and punches somebody, or a fight at home and uh, between a husband and wife who tend to be violent and they're throwing things and smashing things and hitting one another, uh, someone violently uh, lashing out. That's not what this word means at all, and that's not what God is like. The word wrath here uh, is also used in agriculture for a plant that swells. It is the idea that God is justifiably angry, but it's not a quick anger, it's a slow anger. It's a swelling, it's a patient anger, and he's angry with what we have done. It is being revealed. It is not a momentary judgment. Now there is a judgment, there is a wrath coming at the end of the world, that you can escape by faith in Jesus Christ, and we'll see that later. The second thing that we learn from what I read is that we suppress the truth of God uh, by rejecting his rule. Uh, the truth is that his existence is there, but because we don't want him to tell us what to do, we push back. We choose, it says in the text, ungodliness and unrighteousness. And see, ungodliness means the rejection of God. That corresponds to the first four commandments of the Ten Commandments. To worship God, to have no other idols, to not take his vain, uh, name in vain, uh, to hold him up. Unrighteousness here refers to commandments five through ten. That is the way we treat one another, how we behave in the world. So, Paul is telling us here, and he 
he's not just making this up, this is all throughout the Old Testament, is that God is angry because we have rejected him and the way we are treating ourselves and one another. And through that, we are saying no to God. We say no to God. You see, that's just what God is upset about. So I want to ask you this question. Do you think it's fair for God to be upset? For God to be angry uh, with our deliberate choice to reject him and his commands? Let me try to put it on a human level. Let's say you're a parent and you have in your house an adult child. An adult child, not a, not a young child, but an adult child. Someone who's fairly well along in life, probably should be on their own, but they're home with you. And they say to you, you know what, I'm not going to do anything you say, even though this is your house, and you're paying all the bills, by the way. This adult child is living off what you've given them. I, I'm not going to do anything you say. Uh, I'm going to uh, disrespect you to everyone I know. I'm going to steal uh, from what's in this home. I'm going to break things. Uh, I will uh, just do what I want or whenever I want. And by the way, the other children that are in the house, I'm going to abuse them. I'm going to steal from them. I'm going to commit adultery with them. Uh, uh, my married friends who come over, my married brothers and sisters who come over, I'm going, to, I'm going to cheat with their spouses. I'm going to covet. I'm going to take what they have. I'm going to lie about them. Wouldn't you be right to be upset with that child, that adult child? Wouldn't it be the right thing to do to confront them with their behavior, to tell them of your displeasure? In fact, we would say, if the parent says nothing and doesn't correct the child and doesn't say, you know what, if you want to act that way, you need to leave, we would say that is a codependent, dysfunctional parent. We recognize that from simple psychology. Well, friends, we don't live in a house, we live in God's world. Uh, cre he created everything. He gave us everything. And yet we're telling him, I don't care about you. I don't care what you say. I don't care that this is your world. I don't care that everything I have you've given me, you've created all this. I don't care about all the other people in the world. I'm going to treat them however way we want. Of course God not only has a right to be angry, but it would be morally wrong if he wasn't angry with us. Third thing that we have learned from these verses I've already read is that God has clearly made himself known in the universe. God's invisible power, his goodness, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly made, it says, known through what has been made. All the earth, the universe, all of life has the fingerprints of God. Now, I could do a whole sermon. I could do a month of sermons on this. It's the argument, the teleological argument, that the evidence of creation points to the existence of God. Now, some people say, well, you know, that was Middle Ages. That's old stuff. Well, we're way beyond that. We know that science has proven that God doesn't exist. Well, my friends, let me assure you, uh, science has not proven that God doesn't exist. It's impossible to prove a negative. It's impossible. And no scientist worth his salt would ever say that science has proved that God doesn't exist. All science can do is observe repeatable phenomenon, run it again, and test the results. That's all it can do. That's why science cannot even verify history. It can only observe what is going on and what is present in a repeatable way. But it's exactly the opposite of what some people assert on the internet and conversations I've had with people that science disproves God's nature. In fact, the more scientific knowledge we have, uh, the more evidence we have of God's existence. It's not denying God. In fact, it's the exact opposite. We have more evidence of an intelligent designer than we have ever had in the history of the world, and it continues to build. For example, let me go small to little. Let me just give you a few examples. The cell, just the cell, the little tiny organism that makes up all living beings. Dr. James Young Tour, uh, he is a synthetic 
chemist, synthetic organic chemist. He has over 100 patents. He's cited 64,000 times by other scientists. He's at the top of the field. You can find his lectures on YouTube. And he explains, I don't want to get lost in the weeds, he, gets, he explains there are four basic components necessary for life, just in cells, and those components have to be all present in a precise way at a precise time in a precise location for life to happen. It's the origin of life. Now, falsely, it's all over the internet that science has created life in a laboratory. That's simply not true. You listen to his lectures because he boldly challenges any scientist to explain the precise origin of life in a cell, just a cell, the building block. No scientist can. In fact, it's impossible to explain. The complexity of the cell and all the necessary ingredients all together in the right place at the right time in the right relationship in the right proportions, it simply cannot happen by chance. It doesn't prove God exists, but it proves that the cell didn't happen. It's like taking a jigsaw puzzle. If you shake up a box of a thousand pieces and you drop it on the floor and open the lid and drop it on the floor, I guarantee you those pieces are not going to be a perfectly formed puzzle, even if you did it a billion times. Well, a cell is far more complex than that. Let's go the other way to uh, the big side of the universe. There's an argument called the fine-tuned universe, and this gets into a lot of physics, astrophysics and, and math, but there are a number of constants in the universe that are all necessary. They all have to be very precise in the nature of their constant. Think of it as a precise number. And they all have to be present at once for the universe to hold together as we know it. If any one of them was missing, or if any one of them were off in any way of their value, the universe wouldn't exist. Constants like the Higgs vacuum expectation value, the mass up-down of strange quarks, the mass of electrons and entronines, electromagnetism coupling constant, strong nuclear force, coupling constant, cosmological constant, the scalar fluctuation amplitude, the baryon dark mass and protein constant, entropy of the universe constant, the number of space-time dimensions, three space and one time. It's actually an astonishingly narrow range, so narrow range, the numbers are so staggering uh, that it is hard to put into words or illustrations. So let me just take one of these constants, the force of gravity. The force of gravity. We all know about gravity. Isaac Newton didn't discover it. He discovered the law of gravity. Now, gravitational force, uh, that holds me down on the floor. It holds our world. It holds planets in relation uh, to each other around the sun and throughout the universe. If the force of gravity varied one click out of, now here's the number, one in 10 parts, 10 to the 60th power. That's 10 with 60 zeros after it, the number so big. And if it varied by one number out of that entire string, that magnitude, if it was slightly less, when the universe started at the Big Bang, the universe would have flown apart. No stars, planets would ever form. If it was one click stronger, the universe would have collapsed back in on itself as a black hole. One out of 10 to the 60th. <laughs> Here's another way to think of that. Think of a target with a one inch bullseye and you've got a 22 caliber rifle. And you take your rifle and I ask you, can you hit the bullseye? And you say, yeah, John, I'm in a good shot. I'm gonna shoot that bullseye. I'm gonna hit it right in the center. And you do at 10 yards. And I'll tell you, here's the accuracy by analogy of 
the preciseness of gravitational force. I'm gonna take that target and back up. In fact, I'm gonna go all the way to the furthest end of the known universe. And in one shot, you have to hit that bullseye. Crazy. So either the universe existed uh, out of uh, physical necessity, that's one argument, but that's not really an argument, that's just stating the obvious that things relate to one another. The question is, why do they relate so precisely to another? So the other argument is, well, the universe existed by chance. The numbers are so beyond the scale, you take all the constants and multiply them times each other, it's simply impossible. So what many physicists do who won't believe in God, they do this. They move from physics to metaphysics. They say, well, we are one of many universes, it's called the multiverse theory, that there is a universe generator that generates multiverses and none of them stick except the one that we have. Now think about that. See, the Bible says there's one universe, one God who created it, and there's evidence in creation. The multiverse theory is, well, there were many, 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 many universes. Of course, you can't see them. There's no evidence of them. You can't prove it. There's no science. We're not in science now, see? The physicists aren't in science. They're in metaphysics. This is sheer projection, sheer speculation. Well, where do they come from? Well, they come from this universe generator. So you're telling me it's illogical to believe that one God created one universe, but that there were multiverses that no one's ever seen or can prove, and they were generated by this giant universe generating machine. Boy, that sounds like God to me. Where's the evidence of that? Let me try to give you by analogy. I put a five meal course in front of you and I say, I'm the cook. And you say, you know what? I don't believe in cooks. In fact, I believe that there are a hundred different five course meals and a hundred different cooks. I've never seen them and I can't prove they're there, but because I don't like you as the cook, I'm gonna, in my mind, create all these other meals and these other chefs. See, the Bible says it's not lack of information, it is lack of willingness. King David says, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. You see, it's not lack of information. It's lack of willingness to believe because at bottom, we don't want to submit to God. That's humanity's problem. We don't like to be told what to do. This really became so clear to me uh, many years ago before I was married. I lived in Michigan. I was doing quite well in business. I had my own house and uh, God had blessed me. And so I rented rooms to grad students just as a way of helping them for next to nothing because I'd been blessed with much. I enjoy people and I wanted to bless them. So I had some pretty sharp grad students because I was at Michigan, not Ohio State. There were a lot of sharp guys there and one was a doctor, another was in a different field, and then I had a third guy who was a mathematician in pure math. And you want to talk about eggheads beyond eggheads. You know, I have a pretty good mind, uh, but I realize I don't have anything going on in here compared to pure mathematicians. His doctoral thesis was an equation of symbols 28 pages long. Well, he liked to eat what grad student does and doesn't, and I had money and food and I like to cook. So I had him invite other grad students, math grad students come over. And I would sit there like an idiot because the conversations were way over my head, but it was fun to feed these guys. And there was one fellow from New York, uh, I think his name was Isaac, and he was doing pure math, a super, super smart guy. And he noticed the Bible and we talked a little bit about God. And so I said, well, what questions do you have about it? So he asked me a question, and I wasn't sure how to answer it. I, I researched it, and the next time I had him over, I said, oh, here's the answer uh, for your question. He goes, well, I got another one. And so this went on for months. 
uh, he would come over for dinner with the other mathematicians, and he would ask me questions uh, about the Bible or Jesus, and uh, I would find a reasonable answer to it. And after a while, I realized this, this just doesn't feel like it's ever going to end. And I said to him one day, I said, you know, I've, I've answered pretty reasonably uh, all your questions. I said, let me, let me run this string out here. If I answer all your questions, would you then become a Christian? And you know what he said? He said, never, because nobody's going to tell me what to do. You see, and that's exactly what Paul says here. It's not lack of information, it's lack of willingness. That's why often in my conversations with people about the existence of God who claim to be atheists or agnostic, when you start pressing in on the evidence of it, and there's other kinds of things, the design of the universe is just one argument. There's, uh, for instance, a very simple argument, someone created everything. The atheist says no one and nothing created everything. It's absurd, isn't it? Well, it's lack of willingness because we don't like to be told what to do. You see, Paul goes on to tell us, verse 21, for although we knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. What he's saying here is that unworship, unworship makes humans mentally futile and morally foolish. You see, we know God exists but we refuse to worship him. See, that's the first step is knowing God exists and then denying him. Uh, we not only don't worship him, it then has an effect on our mind and our morality. Our, our thinking gets distorted. Our, our morality uh, becomes foolish. Verse 23 talks about a terrible exchange. They exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, animals, and reptiles. Idolatry, physical idols were common then. They're still common in many places in the world, but you, you don't have to have a physical idol. You can worship the Kardashians. You can worship a Porsche. Uh, you can worship your job. You can worship your own body. But the point is there is an exchange that goes on when your mind becomes futile and your morality becomes dark because you've rejected God because you don't want to be told what to do. We can't deny that we're worshipers. We don't become non-worshipers. Everyone worships. It's only a matter of what you worship, who you worship, and how you worship. When we deny God in worship, our thinking breaks bad on us, and we self-destruct into the horrible spiral that often happens in individuals, families, in countries, in societies. You see, Whatever we worship in life is what we ultimately become. We become what we worship. I didn't want to put the pictures up here, but you've probably seen pictures of meth addicts. I've seen pictures of young women, beautiful young women at 20 who become meth addicts, and you see uh, their arrest pictures. And by the time they're 30, as meth addicts, they look like they're 80 years old. It literally eats them alive. Whatever you worship will consume you. You worship money, it will consume you, and you won't care about people and, and your family. So you see, that's what an addiction is. People try to overcome addiction with behavioral change, and while that is important, you have to go underneath it. What addiction is, it's a worship disorder. I was talking with someone who was an alcoholic and f had been through more rehab centers uh, than they could, I could even remember how many that person had been through. And as I was talking to them a while ago, I said, you know what the core issue is here? It's not gritting your teeth to behave better. It's a worship issue. It's you value the feeling of being drunk more than the glory of God. And so what you need to do 
is not determined not to drink. Behavioral, again, matters. You need to get the right diagnosis. It's a worship disorder, and you need to repent of valuing feeling good more than worshiping God. And you know what? It clicked for that person, and they've been sober ever since. See, whatever we worship takes over us, and when we stop worshiping God, everything spins out of control. We go into that black abyss of evil. Some are more other evil than others. I'm not saying everyone is equally evil. The Bible doesn't say that, but Bad theology leads to bad behavior. The rejection of God always leads to destruction. So how does God respond to our rejection of him in this spiral that I talked about? Well, he lets us have what we want. That's what verses 24 through 32, and we're going to go through these quickly. God lets us have what we want and lets us suffer the consequences. You see, this is how the wrath of God is being revealed now. He's saying, you want to reject me? Okay. Your mind's going to get confused. Your morality's going to get twisted around. You're going to start worshiping the created instead of the creator. That's going to dominate your life. And there's going to be effects in that. And there's different effects in different people. But he says, you know what? If that's what you want, I love you enough to let you have that until you come to your senses. Some do, some don't. Come to the senses in believing the gospel. That's the parable of the prodigal son that Jesus told in, in Luke. The father let the son go. That's what he wanted to do. He let him have what he wanted to have, and he lived wasted his life in riotous living, wasted his inheritance until, it says, he came to his senses. That is, he repented and turned. And that's what the call of the gospel is, is for us to come to our senses that we've rejected God, we're worshiping the created, and we need to come back to God in faith to put him as king of our life and experience joy and sonship and, and, and all that he has for us. But Let's continue into this important diagnosis. As I read this, this is tough. It talks about sex. It's not very politically appropriate today, but you'll notice as I'm reading through this, three times there's a key phrase, and God gave them over. I, my PowerPoint's wrong. It says have, <laughs> typo, uh, but it is God gave them over. This is the moral mess of the world we have made because of our unworship of God. So I, I want us to be really clear. I want to be really clear. I want you to hear me. Some churches nag on behavior. We don't nag on behavior at Grace Point because I know nagging on behavior is not the issue. The, what we are after is elevating the grace of God for the root problem, and the root problem is Disworship, unworship, rebellion against God. Because when we get that right, behavior changes. But all the things that are destructive are the fruit of dark thinking and dark morality that is futile and morally corrupt because of the worship disorder. And see, that's what faith is. Faith is turning in worship to the living God. So let me just quickly, even though this is the longest part, let me quickly go through this. We'll see that God gave them over to sinful desires of immorality. Verse 24 and 5. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to dishonoring their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and created the, served the creator, rather creature rather than the creator, who is to be blessed forever. Amen. See, this is... God gave them over. What did he give them over to? <clears throat> he gave them over to the lust of immorality. Jesus uh, affirmed that God's intention right from the beginning when he created male and female is to be united together in commitment in marriage and that sex is wonderful and beautiful in marriage. It's fire in the fireplace that is valuable. Sex outside of marriage is fire outside the fireplace. It ultimately burns down your house. 
any form, the Bible is very clear, any form of sexual activity outside of the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman is immorality. Jesus affirmed that, Matthew 19. He said, Haven't you not read that he who created them from the beginning made male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. We cannot separate marriage from sex and honor God. Then God gave them over to dishonorable passions of same-sex activity, verse 26 and 27. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. The men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received themselves the due penalty for their error. Sounds a little tough to our ears today, doesn't it? See, God created humanity as a reflection of him. God is three persons, one nature. One nature, God, three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. And the male-female love relationship is a reflection of the multiplicity of God in male-female. And the unity, the Bible says, one flesh. We are one humanity but we are complementary in nature. And sexuality is complementary for the procreation of children and enjoyment of one another. Complementary sexual experience within marriage is God's intended pattern. Now, some people today think that sex has changed or that uh, we're far more immoral than it used to be. Some people like to decry, oh, the good old days, they're so much better. Well, that's madness. Uh, let's think about where Paul wrote the letter. A little background will help you understand. Paul wrote the letter to Rome, the center of the Roman Empire. What was sexual activity like in Rome? Well, in Rome, <clears throat> prostitution was legal, widespread, everywhere, and public. Every well-to-do home had pornographic paintings on the wall. The homes were filled with clay images of sexual organs or people with abnormally large sexual organs, trinkets that would hang around the neck of uh, the sexual organs of a man or a woman. It was unbelievable. What was activity like? Well, women had sex with other women, but more behind closed doors. Men, it was more allowed to be open. What did the typical Roman man uh, do? What would the Roman citizen uh, be like? What well, was considered unremarkable and normal for a married Roman man to have a mistress, to have sex with teenage boys and girls, and pederasty was commonly accepted as long as it wasn't a free Roman citizen child. If it was a slave, it was perfectly acceptable for men to have sex with very young boys. It was a moral cesspool. Now, why does Paul point this out? Why is this his first example? Well, it's not his only, we're going to keep reading and we're going to see there's a whole list of other things. And let me be clear, all sin is sin. All sin is sin and unrighteous and not acceptable to God. But it's an example of verse 13 of the exchange of the natural for the unnatural. God's pattern is male and female. And see, for the Jews... They're sort of nodding their head and going, yep, 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 those terrible Gentiles. That's the them in the passage. But they're going to they're gonna get their day. When we get to next week in chapter 2, God has his own things to point out to them. 
but immorality to the Jewish mind in the Gentile world was an abomination. We have writings of first century Jews that decried the Gentile sin, especially of same-sex sex, and they were horrified that men would have sex with teenage children, teenage boys and girls, and very young boys. So as the Jews who were hearing this letter read in Rome, they're going, yep, yep, those Gentile Romans. But that's not the only sin by any stretch of the imagination. See, it goes on to say God gave them over a third time, meaning all Gentiles, to a depraved mind to do what not ought to be done. They were filled with, this list is incredible, they were filled with all matter of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, gossips, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. If you think Paul was only concerned about sexual sin or the Bible was only concerned about that, I hope you just heard the weight of that list. There was no behavior that was given a free pass. While some sins have a more immediate and grievous effect, certainly murder is worse than gossip. But in God's eyes, all sin is sin. All sin is unrighteousness. There's nothing not on this list. Inventors of evil. Ruthless. Heartless. Covetousness. The Tenth Commandment. We call it marketing today. Wanting what isn't yours. See, let's be very clear. For the Gentiles and the Jews, and then the Jews have their own sins that are pointed out in chapter 2, the process is simple. You deny the knowledge of God, it debases your mind and your morality, and it produces fruits of evil. And you worship creation, whatever your choice is. That becomes your God. That controls you. That's what you're addicted to. And it produces a cycle of bitter fruit and moral chaos. Different people are tempted by different things. Temptation or desire to something is not sin. It's giving in to that. Some struggle with same-sex Attraction, that's not sin. It's part of the brokenness of the world. Just as some struggle with stealing, some struggle with wanting to get high and alcohol addiction. Some struggle with their pride and they want to be elevated. Some struggle with greed. Uh, we all have different soft points in our character, different woundedness. But the point is for all of us, when we reject God, our mind and our heart gets twisted around and we elevate what should not be elevated. And what does God think? Well, God is allowing us to have those full consequences. And then verse 32 caps it all off, where he says, Although they knew God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. It's not just that we do what's wrong, we nod our head and give the thumbs up to others. How many times have you heard of gangs of people watching brutal crimes being committed, cheering it on? It makes your stomach turn. Let's go back and remind ourselves in verse 20. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. We're all without excuse. We know God exists. He's put that knowledge in us. He's put evidence around us. We know we've chosen to worship God. Not. We worship creation. 
we worship within creation anything but God. And it makes a mess of our life. So when we want to know what's wrong with the world, we look in the mirror. We're what's wrong with the world. Now there's a way out. The way out is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which I've explained before. And I know this teaching is a little longer, but it was a long passage and very important to get through carefully. As we continue in Romans, we're going to see how God makes us right with Jesus Christ. But it's as simple as this. We turn from ourself as king. We say, God, you are my God. I put you back on the throne. I take myself off. Give me a new heart. Give me a new life through the Holy Spirit, through the blood of Jesus Christ, which forgives us for all our sins, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done. I let a murderer laying on a hospital table, dying of a heart attack, to faith in Jesus Christ, and he found forgiveness and peace. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, what you've struggled with, how long it's been there, God wants you as his child. Write to us here at our website in the contact form. I'd love to hear from you and tell you more about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for telling us the truth about who we are, that what is wrong with humanity is that we've given up knowledge of you, and instead of worshiping you, we worship creation. Father, help us to turn to you in faith and even if we already have, Lord, help those of us who are Christians to examine our life where perhaps we're elevating something we should not in place of you. If we have behaviors in our life that are wrong, help us, Lord, to repent to those and turn to you. And I pray for anyone listening that they would know, no matter who they are, what they've done, if they say, God, I've been wrong, I confess that, I believe that Jesus died for my sins and I want to be your child and forgiven. I want to elevate you. I want to worship you and follow you. Please come into my life. Amen. If you do that, you have eternal life. Well, God bless you for sticking with it uh, through this. Forgive me on the typo and a couple mistakes. We'll see you next week as we continue in our study of Romans.